Braxis, okay? So this is a Braxis. It is a symbol from a false god. It's a god from Gnosticism, okay? And I got quite a bit to say about that. So let's read what we got here first about Abraxas. Abraxas was a word of mystic meaning in the system of the Gnostic Basilides, being there applied to the great Archon, the princeps of the 30, 365 spheres. The word is found in Gnostic texts such as the Holy Book of the Great Invisible Spirit and also appears in the Greek magical papyri. It was engraved on certain antique gemstones called on that account Abraxas stones which were used as amulets or charms. Okay, so he's got a rooster head and two snakes for legs holding a shield, a shield, a body of a man, torso of a man, and he's holding a flail. It's Tertullian talking about Basilides' description of Abraxas. Okay, so Tertullian was, you know, he's called one of the early church fathers, a Christian, right? He talked about Abraxas. Here's what he said. Uh, afterwards broke out the heretic Basilides. He affirms that there is a supreme deity by name Abraxas, by whom was created mind, which in Greek he calls nous, that thence sprang the word, that of him issued providence, virtue, and wisdom, that out of these subsequently were made principalities, powers, and angels, that there ensued infinite issues and processions of angels, that by these angels 365 heavens were formed and the world in honor of Abraxas whose name if computed has its in in itself this number uh, I'm sorry in this number has in itself this number 365 this was talking about now among the last of the angels those who made this world he places the God of the Jews latest that is the God of the law and the prophets whom he denies to be God, but affirms him to be an angel. Uh, but if you look in later, the, the, you know, the traditional Gnostic belief is that the God of the Bible is evil. He's called the Demiurge, right? And that God created everything, created matter. And matter, okay, so the Demiurge is evil and everything he created is evil. All matter is evil. Even human bodies and flesh is evil. And that our uh, bodies are prisons. And inversely, they say that Lucifer is good. And he was just trying to give knowledge, the gnosis, to humankind to liberate them from the bondage and the tyranny of this evil demiurge God. Right? And that's why, you know, they believe... Gnostics believe that salvation can be found through acquiring secret hidden knowledge. Eventually you can become a god, right? But also this whole thing, this belief, another note about that, this belief about, you know, matter being evil, and including flesh, human bodies being a prison, it leads to some pretty crazy uh, conclusions by some Gnostics. Now, not all Gnostics are the same, but one uh, group, offshoot of a Gnostic sect, would be the Process Church of Final Judgment. Now, I'm not going to speak a lot about them right now, but I could quite a bit. And basically, you know, they were said to go away, but they had offshoots after that. And their basic belief which I can prove, is that since flesh is evil, matter is evil, and it's a prison, the only way to liberate humans is to kill them. Okay? And so we could go way, 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 way down that rabbit hole, and we may or may not do that another day, but you can see where that, that belief would lead, could lead. So anyways, there's Tertullian's quote about Abraxas, there's, there's actually even groups with the name Abraxas in it that have existed and may exist today as well. He carries a whip and a shield called Wisdom and Power 
Amulets and seals bearing the figure of Abraxas were popular in the 2nd century and were used also in the 13th century in some of the seals of the Knights Templar. Okay, there's another group using uh, depictions of Abraxas a long time ago. Knights Templar and some, you know, that was the Knights Templar were forerunners to Freemasons, also the Jesuits. Um, some say the Jesuits are actually just a continuation of the Knights Templar, you know, because the Knights Templar were abolished. They supposedly went away and seem to be a continuation under a different name because, you know, groups often, you know, seem like they're destroyed, they're abolished. They're scattered, but then they reappear under a different name. They just change the name. Same beliefs, though. Let's continue. The Swiss psychiatrist Carl Jung wrote a short Gnostic treatise in 1916 called The Seven Sermons to the Dead, which called Abraxas the supreme power of being transcending supreme power of being transcending both God and devil and unites all opposites into one being. And so let's look at these two quotes that he says, what Carl Jung says about Abraxas. And, uh, and then I'll make one more comment about that. So from this thing, it's called um, the seven sermons to the dead. From the second sermon, he said, there is a God about whom you know nothing because men have forgotten him. We call him by his name, Abraxas. He is less definite than God or devil. Abraxas is activity. Nothing can resist him but the unreal. Abraxas stands above the sun God and above the devil, if the Pleroma were capable of having a being, Abraxas would be its manifestation. And then one more quote from the third sermon. He says this, That which is spoken by God the Son is life. It, he means, he says, uh, God the S-U-N. Uh, son, that which is spoken by the devil is death. Abraxas speaketh that hallowed and accursed word, which is life and death at the same time. Abraxas begetteth truth and lying, good and evil, light and darkness in the same word and in the same act. Wherefore is Abraxas terrible? Okay, and then I got a quote from the Bible that directly applies to this. Isaiah 520, which says, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. And that's what he's doing right here. Saying Abraxas begets Life and death and truth and lying, good and evil, light and darkness, all the same time, combining them together. And did you know that's exactly what they did in the process? You know, uh, the founder of the process, Robert de Grimston, he, they, they talked about, the, he came up with this belief that they worshipped four gods. Jehovah, Christ, Satan, and Lucifer all at the same time. They combine them together. And they actually believed that in the end times, Jesus and the devil, all four of these were working together uh, for the same purposes. And, they, and they're, they're in agreement with each other. And uh, so that, that actually the devil's doing good, right? And so, uh, yeah, they have these very twisted beliefs, but that comes from this fusing of their... You know, truth and lying, good and evil, all this stuff. Because, and that's what happens actually with a lot of people that end up doing really bad things, really evil things, is they say that they're beyond good and evil, right? They don't believe in concepts such as sin, as good and bad, as good and evil. They don't believe in any of that. They say they're beyond it. But problem is when they go beyond it, they just end up doing evil. And they never say, well, I'm beyond good and evil, and then they just do all these amazing good things. It's always something bad, right? Um, very similar to uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, right? He believed he was beyond that, right? He didn't believe in God. He rejected all his concepts. And then um, transcending good and evil. So very interesting. All kinds of rabbit trails we could go down. But anyways, that's a little bit about Abraxas. Uh, let's get it, talk a little bit more about that. It's very uh, interesting because, and the reason I'm showing this is because, you know, obviously we're showing that um, this guy Elijah Bond, the Freemason, had this knowledge when he put together this board. But also, you know, uh, a lot of these things 
up here in in our, our culture too that you they pop up everywhere and you when I'm talking about this stuff it'll help you to spot these things in a lot of different places that you may not have been aware and that brings us to the next point Salman Rushdie's novel Midnight's Children contains a reference to Abraxas in the chapter Abracadabra now this is something that was actually uh, you have heard used in children's cartoons growing up even in you know like uh, Looney Tunes they would use that word abracadabra well did you know it's actually a real word that comes from the occult all right so let's read this quote abracadabra not an Indian word at all a Kabbalistic formula derived from the name of the supreme god of the Basilidian Gnostics containing the number 365 the number of the days of the year and of the heavens and of the spirits emanating from the god Abraxas okay so there's a connection in case you didn't know between the word abracadabra and abraxas let's continue regarding the word abracadabra uh, alistair crowley regarded it as possessing great power well i don't i'm not uh superstitious he said you know and and by the way with them when they're doing that and they talk about all these words they're also doing all these rituals and all this stuff um so anyways Regarding the word, uh, Alistair Crowley regarded it as possessing great power. He said its true form is abra hadabra, right? So he changes that, the C to an H. And he said that word is a word that first publicly appeared in the Book of the Law, Crowley's book, Central Sacred Text of Thelema, which is Alistair Crowley's religion. Its author, Alistair Crowley, described it as the word of the aeon, which signifieth the great work accomplished. This is in reference to his belief that the writing of Liber Legis, another name for the Book of the Law, heralded a new aeon for mankind that was ruled by the god Ra Horkuit, which is a form of Horus, and Abrahadabra is therefore the magical formula of his new age. And then, okay, so there's that. Now, here's the last thing we're going to talk about. Well, actually, let me finish this, these two, two uh, sentences. The name Abraxas also is found in the Greek magical papyri. The Greek magical papyri has to do in part with the summoning of demons and thus may be the root of the belief that Abraxas was a king of demons. And it should be noted in 1913, Aleister Crowley wrote the Gnostic mass, mass of the Ecclesia Gnostica Catholica in which the name of Abraxas is invoked as part of the ritual, okay? The Gnostic Mass. And even to this day, um, you know, the order that Aleister Crowley used to control, the Ordo Templi Orientis, they're a Gnostic order that practice sex magic, and they still to this day do a ritual called the Gnostic Mass, okay? And in that, they're invoking Abraxas. Okay, so there's a connection with Abraxas and Aleister Crowley, the Satanist. Okay, so one last point I wanted to make. Uh, the, the last one about Abraxas is about Joseph Smith, the founder of the Mormons. Okay, and so this Abraxas thing just goes all over the place. And I'm sure you could find a lot more than I'm going to talk about in the show. But let's let's read about uh, Joseph Smith and his mother, actually, because if you didn't know, Joseph Smith, the founder of the Mormons, was actually very deep into the occult. Him and his mother, he got it from his parents. We know for a fact they were into the occult before, and all the way up to creating um, that church and the Book of Mormon. All right, so let's read from. Uh, this is a quote from that book, Alistair Crowley and the Ouija Board by J. Edward Cornelius. It says this, There is an astonishing revelation made by Lucy Smith, Joseph Smith's mother, on this subject. She was concerned that after the trial, everyone might think that her son Joseph and her whole family did little else but occult matters. <laughs> Maybe because they did. In the preliminary draft of her book, she wrote, Quote, let not the reader suppose that we stopped our labor and went at trying to win the faculty of Abrac, drawing circles or soothsaying to the neglect of all kinds of business. Now, this is very significant. When her accounts were finally published in 1853, this paragraph, which contained the word Abrac, was conveniently omitted. 
However, her original drafts do survive for all to see in the historical archives of the Mormon Church, and the Church does not deny her statements, but the mere fact that she mentions the faculty of Abrac implies she knew of or at least heard about secret Masonic teachings. Okay? So she basically let this secret slip out that she knew this. When she said she talked about this faculty of Abrac, this isn't just something you just say by accident, something you just make up. No, you only say that if you have studied it, you have that secret knowledge. And as this guy says, secret Masonic teachings. And again, that's why I'm tying together. You, you wonder why we're going way down this rabbit trail. Well, that's for a reason. Okay? All the guys surrounding creation of the, of the um, Ouija board, Freemasons. Elijah Bond, Freemason. He creates the, the, uh, this other board, the Nirvana board. And he puts a Braxis on it. Now, do you think he just did that for no reason? Oh, it looks cool. I'm just going to put the random decoration on there. No. The same reason that she talked about the faculty of Abrac because it was part of what? Secret Masonic teachings. So maybe Elijah Bond knew about these same teachings. Let's continue. In Robert Hullinger's Mormon Answer to Skepticism, he writes, quote, Abrac from abracadabra and abraxas is a word or formula used on amulets to work magic charms okay so that's all connected to abraxas and you got the word abraxas you got abracadabra and you got abrac all referring and connected to abraxas this gnostic god 18th century masons were said to know how to conceal quote, the way of obtaining the faculty of Abrac, which implied that they knew how to get it. The knowledge about the faculty of Abrac has been around for hundreds of years amongst the private papers of King Henry VI in his own handwriting is the assertion that the Masons of his period concealed the faculty of Abrac in their private papers and teachings. Even all the way back in the 1400s, they're talking about that. The author James Hardy, as far back as 1818, confirms this in the Freemasons Monitor. So does Henry Warden in his book Freemasonry, its pretensions exposed, its faithful in faithful extracts of its standard uh, authors, published in 1828. Both gentlemen discuss how certain Masonic teachings lead the candidate upward to a quote way of winning the faculty of Abrac. So there's all these Freemasons. They kept talking about this faculty of Abrac over and over again. And what is it? The faculty of Abrac refers to an ability that allows individuals to obtain hidden knowledge or gnosis with the spirit world and with angels. In particular, it refers to specific entities that descend through our sun, which according to the ancient Christian Gnostics is ruled by the god Abraxas. Okay, like I said, it's from Alistair Crowley and the Ouija Board by J. Edward Cornelius. Um, and you can go look that up. So, now, let's tie all this together because that's very interesting, That especially that last statement. So, all these Freemasons knew about this secret Gnostic belief, right? Uh, this teaching about the faculty of Abrac. Now, what they say it is, is an ability to allow individuals to obtain hidden knowledge. Okay, so they want hidden knowledge, right? Gnosticism, Freemasons want hidden knowledge. That's why they keep, you know, seeking the light, going up to higher and higher degrees and get the inner. There's the outer exoteric teachings, and then there's the inner esoteric teachings only for the select few. They seek the gnosis, right? People speculate about what the G stands for in the in this uh, square and compass of the Freemason symbol. Some say say it's, uh, you know, the Great Architect. Others would say. Gnosis, the G, right? Others would say the um, generative principle. That others say it refers to this Jesuit um, building over in Rome. It starts with the letter G. Many different things. But the point is they're seeking to obtain hidden knowledge or Gnosis. How? With the spirit world and with angels. Okay? So, think about this. 
the Freemasons, people with Gnostic beliefs, they want to get hidden knowledge and they want to get it from the spirit world. What better way to get in contact with the spirit world and to get knowledge than a Ouija board? As they called it before, the talking board. And so they already knew about this for, as they said, hundreds and hundreds of years. They said, you know, you, we need to get secret knowledge. And the way we get secret knowledge is by contacting the spirit world. And then it was, you know, it's part of a secret Masonic teaching. And then a bunch of Freemasons make a tool used to communicate with the spirit world, market it as a toy and something fun, and send it out to millions of people so they can contact the spirit world. It's almost as if they knew exactly what they were doing. Because some people would say, oh, you know, they were just trying to make a buck. They didn't really believe in all that spiritual stuff. They didn't believe that it actually worked. Really? Well, when the founder who is a Freemason, all the other guys are Freemasons, but when it's the guy who patented it makes another board with a Braxis on it, and then we find out all this stuff about a Braxis, and that the only they believe in contacting the spirit world to get that secret knowledge. I think he might have known what he was doing. I think he knew exactly what he was doing when he they came together and made that board and sent it out to millions of homes. All right. So that's why we went so deep on that Abraxas. 